Hey, what's up, Rattlers? So right now, I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I'm at Garrett Hartle's place at Reach Out Reptiles. If you guys don't know him from his YouTube channel, I'm gonna put his link in the description below. Check him out. But Garrett specializes in super dwarf reticulated pythons and dwarf retics. He has some of the most amazing super dwarf retics that you can only find right here at his facility and nowhere else in the world, and that's why I was really excited to get out here and tour his facility. And if you've ever wondered what makes a super dwarf reticulated python a super dwarf while well, Garrett's going to teach us all about it as we get a tour here at Reach Out Reptiles. I'm Dave Kaufman and I tour the world to see how reptiles are living in the wild and while I'm at it checking out some of the most amazing facilities and reptile expos as well. It's all about learning, appreciation and conservation so come with me and join my reptile adventures. At Zilla, we are dedicated to the innovation of caging, lighting, and equipment solutions that provide proper husbandry for your pet's long and happy life. To see our entire catalog, visit ZillaRules.com. All right, Garrett, I have wanted to come over here for a long time and check out your Super Dwarf Retix. So this is the Office of Reach Out Reptiles. Look at this, this is so cool. That's coming, that's coming a little bigger size. That's awesome. Hopefully in the next couple of years. But yeah, I actually had to, I had everything in one snake room. And I'm still definitely like small time breeder or whatever. This is in the basement of my house. But um, I had been taking over more and more. It was driving the wife crazy. So I, there's <laughs> so I came over here and I mean, everyone knows my style. I think if you've yeah, seen at my this. video before. Yeah, just kind of like my wife calls it crappy chic. So. Yeah. That's we good. take stuff. So yeah, like you were commenting. Uh, yeah, look at this desk. This is, a, this is a neighbor's barn that fell down. That's the roof. This is one of the beams. The leg I made out of a piano we wanted to get rid of, and I burned and took the big chunk of metal out of it. So I awesome. Some old army ammo cans, you know, for storage. Yeah, and yeah, that's awesome. This. It looks new. I should probably hit it with some sandpaper and rest. Yeah, it that's that leave looks. Leave it out in the rain for a while. That looks way too clean and new for in here. Yeah, it's a yeah. little out of place. So you even got to reach out reptiles mugs. Oh yeah, absolutely. Those go in the boxes. So we have our own boxes. We got the mugs and everything. It's uh it's a brand experience. Absolutely know? it is. And it's it's really, you know, honestly what it's about is I think a lot of times people in the industry today t t think too much of animals as commodities. And True. So everything that we try to do is um, you know, I want when you're opening a box and you get a mug, I have a handwritten note with every animal that goes out asking, please take good care of this as my baby, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so you, you actually build in like a, an intrinsic value to the animal. That is really so cool. That whether the mar morph is cool today or not tomorrow or whatever, I want people to have that feeling like, oh, I can never get rid of that. That's my reach out reptiles animal. I have a connection to reach out reptiles through this and stuff. And, and so it, you know, the, the family of reach out customers has really become a kind of its own community. Snake rooms in here. All right, the snake room. Yeah, so one thing you'll notice, uh, first of all, I got all my new freedom breeders in here, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, like I was saying, like setting them up in tubs is not really the only way to do it, but the tubs do a lot of cool stuff. Um, this is how I set them up in a tub. And you'll notice this is actually an adult ball python breeding tub. Yep. It's kind of like the new standard adult ball python. But for super dwarf retics, I mean, this is like a mansion, you know, they've got their little arboreal perch That's that they right. love to hide, uh, hunt from. They hide underneath large shallow water dish. Yeah. So what I'm doing is taking like adult enclosures for ball pythons, um, which are about the size of a lot of super dwarfs and using them for my hatchlings until they get to their adult enclosures. Yeah, so I mean, speaking of adults, I mean, one of the things you'll notice, I'm actually, these are kind of like hand-built uh, PVC enclosures by a buddy of mine named Rob Roush that uh, lives locally here. And we prototyped these, you know, they have the front opening enclosures. The proportions were actually really important for my super doors. But if you notice, each cage is almost cubed. So they're three and a half feet wide, they're three feet deep, and they're two feet tall. And most people would keep a pure super dwarf. Let's see if I can open one of these without getting bit. These yeah, are wild cots. They love to eat. I got the camera rolling, so let's do it. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. good girl. That was so this is this is actually um, a, a pretty rare locality called a carampa. But these animals here, if you look at the size tub, I think this is pretty standard for what people do. But I think for a lot of these semi-arboreal pythons, they have problems maintaining a good, healthy, like, body weight and muscle tone right. when they're in these really narrow cages. Now the amount of floor space is probably okay with her, 
but I would love to see an animal like that, even if the floor space was, you know, ideally a little bigger than this, but if she could get up and reach up and grab over perches, pull herself up, climb up and down, she's gonna have a lot more muscle tone. Right. Well, enter the need for this kind of a cage. So these are much deeper than I think a lot of people realize. But uh, one thing I wanted to show you is that even in this, this 36 inch deep enclosure, it allows them to kind of retreat back into the darkness. And then you'll see there's a shelf up here, really up high. And this is, this is actually like an 18 inch shelf. And she has to go up and pull herself up and get that exercise of moving up sure. and down. And it's, it's a far cry from like a big naturalistic enclosure, which would be great but it definitely accomplishes what they need. So just like the little hides and the babies, they now have an elevated perch from which to hunt, which uh, really helps them out a lot. And then just getting that muscle tone of, it's like doing pull-ups. Right, it's a good enrichment for them. Right, so yeah. they, they go up and down there all the time. Well, enrichment, we actually take it a little step farther. Uh, those people that know me well know that I have a million human children as well. <laughs> and so I have like a playground jungle gym outside. Yeah. And it's the perfect thing for snakes. One of those dome, you know, geometric sure. ones. And it's funny, they always go around it until they get to the top, but there's no top because it's a dome. So they go up and then they go down. Yeah. They go, wait a minute, and then they go up and they go down. And they actually get their aerobics in that one. There you so go, that's, perfect. That's the way we run that here. <laughs> Super doors, they stay small. But I think as reticulated pythons, people always expect them to have this insane growth rate where they grow to whatever size they're going to be right. in a matter of months and then they stay there, but they don't. So uh, I'll give you an example. You know, this is a hatchling, pure Kalatoa. Okay, so just for size reference there, you can see yep. they're, they're tiny. They're a little bit thinner than my finger in width. Now she's not quite a hatchling. She's actually three months old. Wow. But that's as close as a hatchling as I got. And then in a year, you know, they're going to look something like, oh my goodness, you guys, let me show you. You had all these cleaned yesterday though, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, they In a year, coming. you've got this size. All right, so this guy's a year old. This is a year old. This is kind of an unknown locality, um, pure Superdorf. A lot of the Superdorf stuff came in before they had any locality data, so. Gotcha. That's her. And then in about uh, two years, they should look like this. This is not a pure Kalatoa, just one of my smaller bloodline locality crosses. Yep. Which just goes to show you can definitely accomplish Superdorf sizes, you know, with good selective breeding. Right, right. And then three years old, this is actually a three-year-old female. And again, this one's not pure Superdorf either. This actually is a, is a cross to get some morphs in there. Um, but this is a, a three-year-old female. So this is about the maximum size that I really want them to be in this type of an enclosure. And I'll tell you why. In about another year or so, I might think about starting to breed this girl at around four years old. But you can tell right now, look at her. She looks like uh, a teenager, right? She's fit and thin. She's still got her kind of baby body, right, right. if you will. She looks like a, a young animal. And so even with the, they're, they're super active. Mm. And even with the shorter cage, you know, she maintains a great muscle tone right. and everything like that. But, you know, like those of us in life, you hit the big 3-0 and you start to get your, like, I've definitely got my, my dad body these days. Yeah. You know what I mean? So by the time you get to, like, six years old for a retic, that's when they're going to have their mom body. And you'll see this snake here is actually not a whole lot longer than the three-year-old. It's about the same length but she's considerably girthier. Her head looks real small, right, right. her body looks pretty big. But now this is a female that has bred for me once before. And so now she has that adult body and you can see the tendency after breeding even once for a little extra flab underneath, yeah, yeah. you know? Which is beneficial. Yeah, well they need some body fat to, right. for egg production. But what I want, I don't want my snakes, most of the snakes, especially retics you see in captivity, are, are like skinny fat at best, if not obese. What I want is a, a fit athletic animal with good abs, yep. basically, yep. good muscle Absolutely. Tone. All right, so let's talk about the difference between super dwarf and dwarf. Okay, um, yeah, that's actually a really good question. Unfortunately, you know, like a, I think a lot of people think of it like say poodle ratings, right? Right. Standard poodle is this big. Right, right. Miniature poodle is this big. Toy poodle is this big and under, and it's not like that. Um, there's dwarf reticulated pythons, they actually have their own subspecies and they're from an island chain that's south of Sulawesi. There's a bunch of different islands and they, re they represent 
remote, distinct populations. So it's kind of like a hog island boa or something like that. Sure. They're very different from the mainland ones. And so they are, are their own subspecies. So a dwarf retic is a, a scientific, you know, they also call them like a, in uh, Dave and Tracy's new book, um, they call them the Jampea python, right. which is named after one of the main islands. So if you're, getting a, if you're getting a dwarf retic, what we've done is kind of in, in uh, captivity for better or for worse, uh, the powers that be that kind of started the whole super dwarf thing um, created a, this marketing term super dwarf because they were working with the dwarf pythons of, say, Selear Island or Jampea Island, and they were breeding them into different color varieties to shrink down some of the beautiful colors we have but make it in a more manageable easy to maintain animal that's not going to have the potential of exceeding 100 pounds or something someday. Exactly. Um, and so then later they found these other islands that were even more remote, but within the same island chain and the same subspecies, that these islands are literally, some of them are like less than a half a mile across. Right, they're tiny islands. Tiny. So uh, one of the islands, I think it's uh, Carampa. The Carampa Island is like half the size of New York Central Park. And it has an entire race of reticulated pythons that lives there. So to put it in perspective, I mean, that's pretty incredible that anything can survive there, especially because there's no permanent source of food and no water. Yeah. So over time, these things have shrunken down to ridiculous size. This actually, the story about them is what I love. I kind of imagining these things like, you know, going through a typhoon and rafting over on some broken branches and hitting this island that has an elevation of like 20 feet. So it's basically like a shallow reef that it's some mangroves probably not wrong in. with that analogy yeah and so you're basically like some mangroves growing out of a reef and there's an entire population of retics that just refuses to die yeah. and live there <laughs> so the idea is to take these minuscule island populations of kalatoa madu karampa and breed their size genetics into some of the morph traits that we have over time you know you give me hey 20 years and i can make an albino that size you want to see an albino that size uh, we want to see an albino that size i can show you an albino that size Oh, look at that. So this is the, now she's in shed, but this is the purple albino reticulated python that everyone wants. But if you look at her head shape, you look at the pattern on her. Hey, easy girl. Um, you look at the pattern on her and everything. It, it is very super dwarf-esque. So she is 75% Kalatoa with a little uh, jamp sauce, I call it. She got 12.5% dwarf jampea blood on top. In other words, there's only 12.5% mainland influence left, but through careful selective breeding over the course of basically two decades, that's all that's needed to get these to morphs get them in out. There. Yep. So basically, every time you breed them, you get halfway there. So if you told me to take half steps to this rack, you know, for from now to eternity, you know, this step gets pretty close. First generation. Right, yeah. right. Then I get, if I bred back to a pure superdorf again, I get halfway closer and halfway closer and halfway closer and halfway closer. Right. But you never actually get back to pure. So now we have an animal that is as close to a pure island retic as you can get. And she is a young female. She's almost ready to breed. She'll probably get some mom body on top of this, which will increase the weight. But she's basically done growing. And I think a lot of people that looked at her, I mean, look, if you look at my hand, I mean, she could almost sit in my hand. She, right. She curls up as small as a ball python. How old is she? She is uh, about three years old now. So basically, there's no such thing realistically as a super dwarf morph. That's actually a, a purple golden child snow. It's one of two males that exist in the world. Wow. That's your investment animal you were talking about. Absolutely. So this is one of two males that exist in the world. Golden child snow. I'll take it. <laughs> this is actually the only super dwarf, uh, well, it's the only 75% super dwarf phantom female in the world from Andrew Acevedo. Wow. I love your hide boxes. <laughs> I got a video on that too. Yeah. The bucket hack. The bucket hack. I love it. Dollar a piece. Work great. This is actually the first ever super dwarf orange ghost stripe, which is a recessive gene. It's like sunset in ball pythons. Right. In retics. And this is these are the animals whose mom was only 2,650 grams. Wow. That is amazing. So the industry standard, the unwritten rule is that in order to call something a super dwarf, it should have 50% or higher super dwarf blood. That means Kalatoa, Madu, Karampa, maybe an island called Ka uh, Kiowati, but those are a little bit bigger. Um, but there's two ways to do that. So I can take a nice breeder, pure super dwarf, but he's a Madu Kalatoa cross. And this is a young adult male. He will be breeding this year. 
Um, so he is breeding at this size. He will breed at this size. Yes, he's ready to breed. He has not bred yet. So, but he's coming up on two years old now. Wow. So that is super dwarf. Super, super dwarf. Yeah, yeah. Now the thing about it is, back to like right way and wrong way to do that, what a lot of people are doing that are reticulated python breeders that are kind of catching how much money super dwarves are worth now. Right, right. I mean, it's just like the great Eugene uh, Bissett. Right. Says, it's exactly big, big right. Big snake, small market, small snake, big market. I usually don't sell retics uh, because all I do is dwarf and super dwarf. I don't sell these to retic guys. I sell them to carpet python guys, you know, boa guys, ball python guys. And so what the retic guys are doing is they have these large established females that can lay 70 egg clutches. And all they think they need to do is uh, go ahead and just buy one of these little males and breed it to everything that year. And they will have literally every morph they work with in 50% super dwarf, which is great. But what I found over time is that that's not a very good way to selectively breed them. They tend to take after the mom rather than gotcha. the Gotcha, okay. So even if you have a higher percentage of locality influence, if you keep taking this and you make a 50% a super dwarf, and then you raise one of those up and you breed it to a male again to get 75% super dwarf, you're still gonna end up with a pretty big animal because the moms are always on the larger size, not right. the dad. Right, right. So there's a big difference. I can have a 75% Kalatoa that is, and you know, this is Kalatoa and Madu, this is super dwarf, super dwarf. Um, I can have a 75% Kalatoa that's pretty big and a 25% Kalatoa that's pretty small, depending on how I selectively breed it. Sure. So Rattlers, in my family, I have one retic and it came from Garrett and it's a Parthenogenesis retic that I have back at my home facility in Minnesota. But Parthenogenesis, it means that there was no father. The mother just laid a couple of eggs and those eggs happened to be fertile. So that's why I really wanted to come here to Garrett's collection to see the siblings of the retic that I have. And those siblings are right here. This is the Parthenogenesis purple albino sibling to the retic that I have in my family. So the female laid three viable eggs. One of them I have, this purple albino is the other one, and this incredible snow is the third one. I should have bought the snow. It's still available. <laughs> 6,500 bucks? That's it. <laughs> Best deal in the snow market today. Yeah, I don't need a new Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> so if all the super dwarves look like the gray little gravelly snake, I mean, I love that look, but someone else might want like the classic retic look that they saw in sure. a book one time. Sure, sure. So let's take one of these guys out. I'll show you what I mean. This guy. Oh, that's gorgeous. You know what? Let's just take this outside real quick. Yeah, we got to do natural sunlight on this guy just to get how amazingly colorful this animal is. So this is actually from the only captive breeding of this particular locality ever done in the world by a buddy of mine named Jonathan Hoflick. And again, like I said, I mean, you, you work with great bloodlines and you work together with people. It's not about, oh, it's Reach Out Reptiles bloodline. No, it's an accumulation of everything great that everyone's done. Right. So this is a Bontaiang region Sulawesi reticulated python. And as far as yellows and blacks go, this is just as, as good as it gets. You can see the thick, inky blacks and yep. tons of yellow. I love these silver side spears coming up on this animal. He looks nothing, nothing at all like the Super Dwarf Island retics. But because I have an arsenal of small females that produce small babies, the goal is to breed a locality like this animal into those small females sure. to get the pattern influence of this guy with the size influence of the mom and at that point, all I have is a 50% super dwarf normal. So it's still gonna take a lot of work to get morphs into these things. But this guy is actually very closely related to uh, Selire Island um, reticulated python, which really amps up the color as well. You wanna see what one of those looks like with a morph in it? Of course I do. All right, so we just got this guy out. So this is actually already has some Jampea blood in it and the Selire Island, which is similar to this Bantaiang and the platinum gene, which just starts to kick out. He's about a year old. At two years old, this, this gene really picks up, but you can see the rich colors going into the vibrant yellows right. that this yeah. guy has. I mentioned how rare these guys are, the, the Bantaiang region, which is the southernmost tip of Sulawesi by Salire Island. Um, I recently acquired a, another pair of a super rare locality that I'm really excited about. It has a totally different set of traits. 
but I just geek out over this stuff. Well, so let me show you another locality that um, that I really want to take the influence of and, and shrink down in size for the masses. Awesome. Look at this bad boy. So this one is actually a new acquisition for me many, many, many years ago. I actually saw one of these. I remembered the name and I've never seen one since. And this is actually a fresh hatchling, which is ob obviously pretty big compared to the Superdorf stuff that I'm working with. But, um, you know, I, I just had to grab them because I, ha I haven't seen them in right. 15 years or something. And as far as I know, this is the only clutch of them ever captive you know, rep captively reproduced in Is the United right? States. Yeah, by a, uh, a guy named Rodney Bolich. And uh, so he had the foresight to work with these. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but compared to those other guys, they have a really deep, rich red, again, yeah, with the sure huge do. silver side spears. The black is more pixelated on these guys. It's kind of, the pattern is all over the place. So you can't even really explain the pattern. But they have a ton of black within the pattern. And then the coolest thing about these guys, if I was able to show you an adult, I can't, because they're too rare. Yeah. But um, they actually have, you can see it a little bit. This one's starting to get a darker belly. But they these things actually turn extremely black as adults. They're kind of like the black rat snake of the reticulated python right. world. Where the hatchlings come out, and obviously it looks different than your average retic. Looks pretty cool. But every time they shed, as they grow, they get darker and darker and darker till they turn into an almost black snake. Which I think, with all these colors and that amazing pattern, if I could shrink it down into a six to eight foot snake mm -hmm. that, uh, and then maybe put albino in it, like oh, one of our T-positive albinos or something, you would really start to get some stuff. So just give me 20 years okay. and I'll go make one. I'll come back in 20 years and make a follow-up video. Yeah, that sounds good. I, I'm not going anywhere anyway. I've done it for the last 20 years. My, what's another 20? Right, right, right exactly. <laughs> all right, so this rack has all the morphs here. <laughs> this rack has all the morphs. Let me show you. Um, a cool motley tiger. I like this girl. I like when they have really cool chaotic patterns, Ooh. but that's really dark and chaotic. It's got a lot of the cool like porthole window yeah, spots on it. That. So this is a motley tiger, which is a double um, incomplete dominant now combination. This is, a, this is a motley tiger super dwarf. Yes, this is dwarf and super dwarf cross. So this girl will stay relatively small. Okay, so this is actually a super motley. If you take that other gene to the next level, hey, well, chill out. saying hi, yep. Yeah, well, the babies think everything's going to eat them all the time. Well, that's true. And I'm not going to eat you. They oh, figure it out pretty quick. But yeah, patternless, wow. metallic snake. Look at that. I think they look like great white sharks or something. With they, that they white really belly do. and a dark top. The iridescence is pretty incredible on these. Wow, look at that. And if that's not dark and iridescent enough for you, if you add a little bit of Golden Child, yeah, you know, some stuff like this. One of my favorite see. morphs. Really, you like the Golden Child? I Childs? love the Golden Childs. Everybody loves the Golden Child. Let's see here. Look at that. This is actually an Annery, which is that elusive gene that I said comes from the Superdorf Motley Golden Child. And this animal is dark now. It's like a charcoal gray. Um, but they turn nearly solid black. And look yeah. at that cool head stamp. What the heck is going on with That's that? That's what I love about the Golden Childs, are those yeah. head stamps. If heavy metal was a retic morph, <laughs> it would be the Golden Child. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Okay, so then one of the things that everybody loves with the Super Dwarves are, are the albinos. Yep. Well, when you breed them into the, into, the albinos are typically bright orange and stuff, but using the Super Dwarves and the Annery trait, you can actually make a snow. Oh man. So this is an albino anatheristic, just like snow boa. This one tend happen to also have the motley pattern, but this is a snow motley dwarf and super dwarf cross reticulated python. Wow. At this point in time, these are exceedingly difficult to get. It's the old double recessive. Thing. Right. So, you know, what's funny is that from a business and investment standpoint, um, I think I've, I've pretty much built my business on this morph alone. And when this morph first came out, uh, the the founding snow animal that I have cost twenty five thousand dollars. Is that right? And that was over ten years ago. Now other morphs that cost the same amount during that period of time you can now get for like three hundred bucks. But a nice snow female today, ten years later, still five thousand dollars. So they're holding their value. They have held their value more than I think any morph of any reptile ever. I think you're probably right. 
So this is the anery gene on the motley pattern, and you can see the color of this animal is, it's gray, but it's actually a, almost a metallic. Right. And there's a, there's a certain translucence in it that's really difficult to capture in a picture, but their skin almost reflects off the base layer of the skin instead of the surface right, layer. Right. So they have this, this cool translucent. And, and the Motley's is a dark gene, which again, super cool, dark, charcoal metallic, especially the eyes. Okay, let me show you what happens when you lighten the anneries up, but the deal is we gotta shoot these out. All right, let's take them out. Super Tiger, everybody oh. likes a Super Tiger. <laughs> and Holy how about just crap. a normal Tiger, but a really nice one. Oh man, look at these in natural light. Whew. So the cool thing about any reticulated python is that they actually gain color as they grow. So those dark gray little anneries, some of them keep it, but a lot of them get this color in, but unlike the reds and oranges that we had earlier, these are greens and shades of purple, blue. Look like this that. snake, I would, you can only really describe that as like lilac purple. Yeah, absolutely. And green. And then the, look how bright the white is on that this super tiger. That white on that super tiger. Isn't that cool? Wow. So, yeah, this is, uh, I think, one of the, the most underrated morphs. And it's a really powerful tool for people working with the dwarf and super dwarf because it's possible to get this morph in higher percentages right. if you invest in the right bloodlines that have that anery gene in your pure dwarf and super dwarf animals. It's a really difficult thing to find, but over the long run, having a recessive morph in a pure super dwarf or dwarf animal just really gives you outrageous potential yeah. when you start breeding some of the cool mainland morphs that we have into this gene that the mainland retics never see. Oh man, that super tiger is amazing. Aren't those beautiful? Yeah, box this one up for me, will ya? <laughs> what does a super tiger like this go for? Uh, this one is not for sale. Not for sale. I, you know, an anery super tiger, so it all depends on the bloodline. The more generations of kind of size reduction right. that it takes, like that little purple, I mean, people don't realize it takes 20 years to make that. You're not gonna get any other recessive gene sure. that small because when we started the project, albino was the only gene there was. Right, right. So people always like to ask me for the hot new morph in that size. And I'm sure if you look hard enough, somebody will be willing to sell you one, but they just don't exist yet. Right, right. So reticulated pythons, especially dwarf and super dwarfs, man, we're in its infancy right now. Absolutely, and because it is a selectively bred trait and a lot of retic breeders just don't do that kind of thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that can be called a dwarf or super dwarf, but at this point, they're just not all created equally, are they? Right. But let me show you what I mean. The problem with just labeling something a super dwarf and increasing the price is that literally every super dwarf is not created equally, and it doesn't have all to do with percentages. It has to do with the passion, the dedication, and the amount of time that the breeder actually focuses on producing super dwarfs that are small rather than just super dwarfs that have the name so they can quickly make a fast buck. Good point. Check these out. Oh, look at this bad boy. She's a beauty, but this is a 75% Kalatoa Platinum Annery from kind of like one of the old school big box breeder bloodlines where they were focusing on getting high percentage Really didn't care too much about size. I mean, I'm getting tired just holding her. Yeah, yeah, that's a big girl. She looks like a super dwarf. You can see she's got that really thin head. Right. She's got a gorgeous super dwarf pattern, lots of color, but she's gigantic. So you have an animal that is 75% super dwarf blood, but it got literally every trait but the size. Right. It's crazy. Let me show you one of the ones that I've been working with. Okay, now this is one of uh, my bloodlines that I'm working with that is the, the platinum. Uh, super dwarf and it's the same age and same 75% Kalatoa as that other animal. Completely different. Yeah. I mean, look at how manageable this animal is with size. But the funny thing is like if you look at his head shape, he's much blockier, more mainland looking. He doesn't have that real thin super dwarfy pattern. Right, or, right. As much as the female does. Cool. He's certainly got a lot of super dwarf influence. Yeah, he's got that pixelation up here. But what we've bred are really intense red colors from those mainland types. 
that blocky head that just I mean look how cute he is you just want to you just got to squeeze those cheeks <laughs> you know what I mean you got to boop the snoot right and all the size that you want <laughs> all right so this rarely ever happens but I'm here at a perfect time because you just had a clutch hatch out and From this is face. the sire yeah that's right yeah you want to see what they look like I do babies? yes absolutely I do who doesn't want to see baby retics all right so You've got a mobile incubator here. Yeah, I actually did a YouTube video on Reach Out Reptiles yeah, channel. Yeah, I remember this. that. Everybody loves it. This is the best incubator system. <laughs> I've had very expensive ones. And right, stuff, right. But, uh, you know, sometimes the oldies are, are the just good the good old cooler. I love it. Yeah. Look at that, guys. So here they are. Oh, and I don't man. know. Here's one of the empty ones that we pulled, but look at the size of that egg. I mean, that's that's a ball python. That's egg. a ball python. Egg. A little bit bigger than a ball python egg, but yeah, not as big as a retic egg. That's for sure. Yeah, it's no softball. But here, check look this out. Look, cuties. so this one has that platinum gene, like that father did that came out. Right. And you can see just how orange and red this wow. is from the different bloodlines. This guy too, really nice platinum thin refined pattern the mother of this clutch was a marble which is like this little this little beauty right here it has extremely chaotic pattern from the mutation but also if you notice the sire of the clutch how speckly he yeah, was yeah. so it was a really good uh pairing because you're you're accentuating a specific type of trait wow look at that look at the pattern on this one right here yeah yeah fresh hatchling i have one that came out already that has both genes Man, these are amazing. Okay, so this one already came out. Yeah, so this one's already out, and this has both genes. It has that marbled pattern, as well as that bright platinum yellow, which continues to get brighter and brighter as they grow. But look at the, the cool pattern, tons of Superdorf influence, because of just how selectively bred the lines were, and these are high percentage Kalatoas. Wow. But look at the, um, this is one of my favorite traits. Look at those beauty marks. A lot of the Kalatoas, they tend to have like a little Cindy Crawford mole on yeah, one side or the that. other. And I always loved it, so I always keep back animals that have them, and this one's got like 20. That's pretty it's awesome. Great. All right, so while we're talking about babies and breeding, what is the methodology of getting your retics to breed? Uh, so, you know, super dwarves are kind of funny. It's, it's really, I would consider even as somebody that's produced a fair number of them, something that we're still learning about. So it's really fun to get into because you really have to study the snakes. You're not going to find a book online about how to breed a super dwarf. Right. Um, and it's really through talking with other breeders and their experiences that you're going to learn that stuff. But from everything we can gather, because of the type of islands that they live on, with no permanent food sources in many cases, right, right, right. that uh, they tend to be very, very seasonal. So with any reticulated python, life revolves around food. So with the super dwarfs, the biggest thing is keeping them with a good healthy body type you know letting them have the exercise and everything that they need for a tiny female to push out a ton of eggs like this it takes a lot of muscle muscles so they you have to treat them like the semi arboreal snake that they are sure number one and then secondly the biggest thing is just cycling them with food in other words you feed them pretty lightly throughout the years the throughout the year the females so that they don't become obese and then you feed them really heavily right before the breeding season so they get a few extra calories to mm -hmm. pack on and put into egg production and then laying those eggs is like the best diet ever for them so you really can't overfeed them right before they breed they just convert it all into eggs all right so at what age and what weight does the average female and male reach sexual maturity well because you're talking about crossing an animal that might be six and a half feet and four or five pounds to an animal that might be 16 feet to 18 feet and 200 pounds, yeah. um, there's gonna be a huge variety there. But in general, the pure super dwarves, females won't even think about breeding until they're four or five, maybe six. I've had them hold out until they were eight years old sometimes. The females at eight, 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 eight years. Yeah, the females. Okay. So uh, it's definitely not some kind of a get rich quick species, that's for sure. You have to really love them and wanna work with them. Um, the males can breed pretty safely at about two years old, as long as you can get enough size on them to do that, which is hard because genetically they just don't want to grow. Right. Um, but that's what you're looking at for size. And then the pure super dwarves, you know, you want a female to be, uh, you know, you're basically more than a weight going for a body type. You want big, thick, you know, good muscles, and then that little bit of saggy belly right before she lays. So a lot of those females will weigh uh, well, like I said, I mean, I just got a clutch off of a female that was about eight feet and she weighed 2,650 grams. Wow. So anything from like 2,500 grams to maybe 8,500 grams 
for like the the uh, smaller super dwarf bloodlines. And then the crosses, it all goes out the window. Like the two animals you saw that mm -hmm. the exact same percentages and the same age uh, with the same type of food schedule. One just got a lot bigger than the other. So a lot of it's going to depend on how good the bloodlines are that you invest in. in the gotcha. Place. And then what about a cool down period or a cycling period? So these guys actually, I think that they are a more temperate species than uh, or subspecies than a lot of the mainland retics. They like cooler temperatures. They like a little bit more ventilation, mm -hmm. which makes sense if they live on a tiny island with the ocean breezes. Right, you know, right. It's always 20 degrees cooler at the coast. Absolutely. These are basically like a beach bum type of a snake, you know, <laughs> and uh, so they, they like it a little bit cooler. They don't necessarily need a cool down. They're equatorial, and uh, so there's not a lot of, of seasonal variance as far as cold and hot, but they do need cooler temperatures than most people think, so I like to give them a cold spot of about 75. And then my hot spots are, are right around 85, 86. So as far as like ball pythons are concerned, you give them a, a night drop and that sometimes stimulates breeding activity. Not with these guys. No, not too much. They'll actually breed pretty much year round. Um, for me, they don't breed in the summer here because my room just gets a little bit too hot mm. for any kind of fertility. So right. if, I, if I do try to breed them in the summer, I end up with less fertile babies. So I just give them the summers off. But for the rest of the year, yeah, we, we can breed them year round and cycle them based on food. All right, Garrett, so you have given us a lot of information to process about these really awesome snakes. Thank you so much for having me out here. You have, hands down, the most impressive retic collection I have ever toured. Rattlers, I want you guys to comment below and let me know what your favorite retic that you saw in this video was as soon as I'm done with this video. Yeah, I'm walking around too. this place. Yeah, yeah, I'm walking around this place. I'm gonna do some shopping. So hit that like button and hit that share button. Check out our sponsors. Their link is in the description below. Uh, hit that subscribe button when you do hit that bell so you never miss an upload. And until the next reptile adventure, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle, rattle on. on.